this podcast is brought to you by Midwinter. These guys were a startup, an entrepreneurial startup some 10 years ago, way before it was even cool to be a tech startup, and have since then gone on to win every single award year after year after year when it comes to financial advice software. I use them, um, I know a lot of people that have, and if you haven't already jumped onto the new way of doing business, which is all cloud-based and API, so it all talks to each other, then go look at yourself in the mirror and sort yourself out and go get Midwinter. Thanks for coming, Brad. Um, Brad Fox is the CEO of AFA, the Association of Financial Advisors. Uh, he's kind enough to come and talk to us about what he sees the future of advice being. Um, being one of the biggest associations in the industry, uh, he has an important role in kind of shaping and framing uh, where the industry is going. Uh, so thanks for coming, Brad. Uh, good to be with you guys. So the first question is, um, what is the AFA uh, and, and how is the membership broken up? Sure. Um, the AFA has been around for 70 years, uh, came initially out of the life insurance industry. Um, but over the last 15 years, our membership has changed pretty dr drastically. Um, in the last two years alone, we've grown 60%, over a thousand new members the last 12 months. And the, the makeup of our membership now is um, around about 12 to 15% of our members are life risk specialists, which is our old heritage but the balance of our members provide broader advice. And some like the word holistic, some don't like that word, but it's broader advice across multiple disciplines with every specialisation covered as well. So we've got self-managed super fund specialists, estate planning specialists, investment specialists, and so on. So uh, our membership now is about 3,600, uh, had about 100 new members in the last month. Um, and age-wise, getting younger all the time. Uh, Ten years ago, we started Gen Next, and since then, the AFA average member age has been coming down by about a year every year, which, of course, you'd think it should be getting older by a year every year. But uh, Gen Next has brought that younger demographic into the AFA, and it's made a big difference to us. Yeah, great. All right, it'd be remiss of me not to get you on and ask you a few uh, hot topics. Uh, so we're just going to touch on it. We don't really want to spend the whole interview um, talking about uh, political themes in the industry, um, but uh, we, we need to touch on them. So uh, let's try and keep the answer really short. Uh, how is the AFA involved in life insurance framework? You want me to make a three-year story short? Okay, I'll That's try. Right. Um, into, I'll, I'll say just very quickly, 2012, we were in discussions with the FPA and the FSC uh, the FSC wanted to change life insurance commissions back then, and it would have been 80-20 and a two-year callback. Um, it fell over. One company pulled out of that. The AFA and FPA, by the way, we weren't supportive of that back then. Um, out of the back of that, Bill Shorten called for a review of life insurance, which was the ASIC review, Report 413. That came out on the 10th of October 2014. And the week after that, um, Michael Novak was the AFA president then. Um, uh, Mike uh, committed us with the FSC to conduct the Life Insurance and Advice Working Group, which was later known as the Trowbridge Report. Um, that was an interesting battle. You know, we signed up to that to make sure the advisor voice was heard in the debate. And we then didn't uh, agree with a number of Trowbridge's recommendations. So since then, it's then, um, and during that process, about 100 advisors only put in their views. Um, we went to our membership four times to ask for views. We got about 100. After that, after the Trowbridge report, Josh Frydenberg was the minister, and he put together, um, well, he banged heads together and got a, uh, a first cut of the framework. Uh, Josh then was replaced by Kelly O'Dwyer as minister, and we've continued to negotiate um, with Kelly O'Dwyer, and we now have the framework as it stands today. It's been a very, very challenging couple of years because we're battling an ideology that commissions are bad. That's what politicians think. It's what consumer groups think. Um, it's what some of the, the XY advisors think from the discussions I've had with some of your followers. Uh, but there's others, of course, that have got a 20, 30, 40-year history 
of operating very successfully, fairly uh, and well for their clients with commissions. So it's a real shake up to their identity to have to change that style of business. All right, so do, do you think the AFA's uh, involvement was effective? Um, would you say you're happy or unhappy with, with the result given your involvement? Um, we were effective. There was a very, very strong company push, not from all insurers, but certainly from uh, a reasonable number that have very loud voices to go to level commissions only uh, under this framework. We think that's a step way too far for what um, existing providers of advice that are used to using commissions, have businesses built on commissions, have debt uh, that's being paid off on relating to their business through commissions to have to change to that degree. Um, so uh, we fought hard in that regard and we would like it to have been a little higher than where it's ended up in terms of the commission rate. Um, and we would like clawback to have scaled down in the second year. But the political forces won't allow that. And I don't just mean the coalition. Uh, and we've also got the financial system inquiry, which has been a, a big force on this of saying that we should be at level commissions only. So there are enormous forces saying change has to happen and the change has to be pretty radical compared to what today is. So I think we have been effective in getting to a position where um, advisors will be able to operate a sustainable practice that the impression that commissions are too high, whether that's right or wrong doesn't matter, it's an ideology, but that is now significantly changed by the, you know, on the face of it, about a halving of upfront commissions. Um, and I think if we look just a step further, what this is, there's two things that this was supposed to be about. It was supposed to be about improving the quality of life insurance advice. It doesn't directly do that. It only does it indirectly by making sure advisors know they're under notice that if they were writing business unsustainably, if they were doing replacement business not in their client's best interests, they're on notice for that now. Um, and that's that's not a bad thing because the good advisors have no trouble with it. So yeah. that's one thing. The other aspect though, is we have to think about what is the real force of change here. The real force of change is that advisors have under the commission model forever been a price taker. In most forms of business, when you're trying to create a great business, the last thing you want to be is a price taker. You want to be a price maker. So if I was an advisor today, and, and when I speak with guys from XY um, and from our Gen Next group, there's, there's so less um, wedded to the idea of commissions. There's so many of them going commission free on risk insurance advice and just charging a fee. That removes this dependency on the product provider as a price taker. It's a much smarter way to build your business, but of course there's significant challenges in how you do that, particularly if your client base is younger and cash flow isn't an easy thing to pay fees from. Yeah. So these are the forces that are bringing change to the market and, and we mustn't forget that it's that bigger force of clients, uh, the public saying commissions they're concerned about, we've got direct insurance pushing in, how do we compete against that? We've got to differentiate away as advisors rather than compete and let it be commoditized. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to run down the price maker, price taker um, garden path, but we, we don't have three hours, so we're gonna move on. Um, <laughs> the next question is about all the different associations. I just did a quick Google uh, this morning. What did I find? I found the uh, AIOFP, the LICG, the FBA, the AFA, the uh, uh, IFAAA, um, and and from an advisor's point of view, there seems to always consistently be infighting. This association is better than the next. Uh, that association is bad. I read last week that uh, if we support, as advisors, FBA uh, and AFA, we're funding the enemy. Um, so, hot topic, really quickly, uh, how do you um, uh, f f deal with the, the infighting between the associations? Two years ago, or 18 months ago, more accurately, um, the infighting between the AFA and the FPA 
which was always overblown in the way it was talked about, um, has stopped. We're now working extremely collaboratively between the AFA and FPA, and I'm sure they won't mind me saying that. Um, so from that point of view, uh, that, that has stopped. And this is very much about, again, heading uh, united to out down the professionalism path and putting a, a single voice to, to government. Um, the self managed Super Fund Association, similarly aligned in, in most areas that the AFA and FPA are, are working towards associations. And they have their constituency, they have their followers, but they have some distinct disadvantages to what uh, we have. So, for example, they can't be registered under the Tax Practitioners Board as a financial advisor recognised association, which means their members um, don't get the exclusion on needing to do two of the training units for having six out of the eight years experience and a professional body membership. So that's an important differentiator. People that have been, that would leave uh, the AFA or FPA to go to one of the smaller bodies would lose that exemption. Um, it's also important to understand uh, what is an association and what is not. So LICG is not an association at all. It's not an entity. It doesn't have any legal entity at all. It's not a company. It's not a cooperative. It's not a partnership. It's not an association. It doesn't have a membership fee. It doesn't have a constitution, no bylaws, no elected office holders. It doesn't have any of those things. It doesn't carry that weight. So they uh, have a website. They have a, a voice that uh, they do via press releases, um, but it is not an association. It won't uh, help anybody uh, as we go down the professionalism, uh, professional standards path, where all advisors are going to have to come under a code issuing body. Now, this is, this is really significant about where we're all headed. The professional standards legislation is going to mean you've got to be signed up to a code that's produced by this body, and it has to be proactively monitored by a code issuing body. Um, the AFA and the FBA are well placed to do that, as is uh, SMSFA. Um, it means we have to proactively uh, look at our members and what they're doing. Are they measuring up to that code? And in addition to that code is what we add in our own code. So somebody will not have the resources to be able to do this, to proactively monitor members and fulfil the requirements. So these are some of the differences that are there, as well as the regard that they're held in by government. Yeah. Uh, we're at the table on every government who related to financial advice. Um, these others aren't. Yeah. So yeah, you've you've kind of semi answered my my next two questions. Um, uh, what's and Brett Evans has actually asked it. Uh, so what is the benefit of an advisor joining uh, an association? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, look, going back 10 years ago, when I first became an advisor, I came from outside the, the industry, I, knew, I didn't have any experience. Um, my own belief is that if you're in something, you need to stand up for your, your, your involvement. And joining a professional body is the first step in saying, I am part of a profession, I put my voice to it, and I have an impact on it, and it has an impact on me. If you're not prepared, to sign up to a, a, a code of ethics, a code of conduct, and be held to account for those standards that go above the law, this is now about ethical conduct, then I'm not sure that we ever get to reach the stage of being a profession. You need to be able to put your hand up and say, I subscribe to a code of ethics and conduct that is that puts me in the frame as a professional. So that's the first thing. The second thing is we've been through uh, endless legislative uh, change and debate, if you don't have a professional association speaking on your behalf, then I don't know how you get heard. You need, we need strong professional bodies to be able to carry that voice in an advocacy sense to government. Um, that doesn't mean every one of our members likes every position that the association has, yeah. but, but we're much stronger when we stand together and carry those opinions forward. And the, the other things, and, and this goes back to what our members have told us, that the third thing they want is they want us to represent the professionalism of advisors to the public and work on the public understanding and perception of advice, which is what we're doing with your best interests. 
um, TV program and, and digital content strategy. Yeah. Yeah. And fourthly, they want a sense of belonging. You know, you guys operate your own businesses and it's not always easy to uh, feel empowered and uh, have someone to talk to, particularly once you start employing staff, uh, you hit glass ceilings, you hit hurdles, you want this sense of belonging to something bigger than yourself because that's where you get the peer-to-peer -peer reflective time. You get to learn from others' experience. So they're all the value drivers. All right, this, this next one's a curly question and it, and it also came from Brett as well. Uh, why would we choose AFA instead of FPA? Well, that comes down to a cultural fit. Um, I, I tell you what I did. Ten years ago, I went to an FPA event and an AFA event about three or four weeks apart. And I went to choose for the sole purpose of choosing which one I was going to join. Now, at that stage, um, the AFA event absolutely uh, excited me no end with great presenters, fantastic engagement. The other members were friendly and made, you know, made me feel welcome. And I didn't get the same sense from the FPA event I went to. I chose AFA, simple as that. So there, the, the other, it's finding that fit for you as to where you think you belong. It's also about thinking about what designations you might want to do down the track. Um, our designation, the FCHFP, is deliberately created to be very different to CFP. It goes more down the master's pathway in regards to going outside of the basics of the technical stuff of super investment, etc., and gets into how do you take the technical knowledge and apply it to consumer outcomes, client outcomes, yep. so that you're building business plans, marketing strategies, government plans. So the, the education element is a very important determiner for new entrants to the, the industry or profession now. Yeah, for, for me, I, I did that. I just went, I signed up to be a member for both, uh, went to events and then chose one from there. Um, uh, so, uh, what are the three things that you'd like to see uh, changed in the industry? <laughs> Only three. Only three. Um, I think we'd all love to have a period of stability. So, let, let's wind the clock forward six months and uh, um, let's consider that perhaps by then we've got the professional standards, legislation and regulation complete that the, the life insurance framework has been implemented as well, um, then I would like to see a period of stability where advisors can really spend their energy and time on adapting to bring cost efficiency to how they provide advice. I think that's going to be absolutely critical over the next uh, number of years is how we bring that efficiency. Um, so if we can stop needing to react and change our businesses from a compliance point of view, to yep. suit new and additional regulation, we get the time, space and money to put into those areas. Um, I think I'd also love to see um, a far better discussion being had about succession planning again. You know, before the GFC, there was an enormous amount of talk about succession planning for financial advice practice owners. We do have a lot of older guys running and owning businesses that are looking for exit strategies, but it's not well coordinated at this stage. Um, you know, if you've got a business turning over perhaps a million bucks of recurring revenue and it's worth somewhere between two and a half, three and a half million dollars, I don't know how Phil Thompson or Ben Nash pluck out two and a half or three million bucks to buy it. Well, Ben, so we need to get a much better success. <laughs> And I think maybe a final thing is I would love to see us um, being really successful in helping um, the much wider Australian public understand what financial advice actually is and what are the triggers and the values that come out of getting advice so that we've headed much more down the coaching, consulting, teaching path of advice uh, rather than the transaction product uh, interactions part. Yeah, cool. Last question from me, and then we're going to uh, hand it over to Ben to ask a few follow-up questions and then um, questions from um, people who are watching because we've, we've got plenty. I've kind of kept my eye on it, and I know there's heaps coming in. Um, so this last question, I want it to be super short. I know it's difficult for you to um, give soundbite answers, um, but where in, in the next three years, where do you see the industry on uh, – I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit you up on – three or four different things. 
so the first one is where okay. do you see the industry being on pricing models? Do you see it being the same, slightly different, or, or completely different to what we've kind of got now? Um, I think the trend towards uh, flat priced agreements is going to continue. And I think a lot more advisors are going to have clients on pricing models where the client has all the power to switch you on and switch you off, which means high engagement, high touch. Okay, great. Uh, professional standards. Uh, passed in legislation, uh, the professional standards body signed off all the uh, courses that provide the pathways for new entrants and um, transition pathways. For existing, uh, we will have the exam or its equivalent in place and advisors will be starting to sit it and we'll all be wondering whether or not it's actually examining the right areas in the right way and looking for feedback on that. All right, the last one, licensees. How do you see the, that, uh, the, the current framework? How do you see it being in three years' time? Different or the same? I think the licensee space will change incredibly. I'm not sure whether it will be in three years or a bit longer. Um, licensees will have to find additional ways to provide value to their advisors. Um, more advisors are already heading down the self-licensing path. Uh, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I'm not sure. But larger licensees, um, you know, perhaps those with more than 50 advisors are going to need to have very good value propositions about how they bring uh, efficiency and coaching and development to their advisors to have a competitive offer. Awesome. All right, I'm going to throw it over to Ben. I've gone well over my time. Um, so go, Ben. Up to you now. Okay. Cool. So I just got a couple of quick questions for you, Brad, before before we get to the audience. Um, there is heaps of questions coming through. So um, again, we'll uh, try and keep these short so I can get to everyone else's questions. First question though for you, what is the AFA doing to represent the, the interests of newer advisors or those in the, the XY sort of community, given that we're um, a smaller minority in the member base? Uh, ben, we've been very forward focused ever since we created Gen Next, and um, some of your listeners will know I was the first chairperson of Gen Next 10 years ago. Um, the future always has to be where an association is looking, not to the past. And that doesn't mean you don't honour the past, but you have to be forward looking. So as we create policy positions, as we've created our communities of practice, and we're about to hold a a two-day boot camp with about 50 advisors coming from around the country to plan out the next 18 months of engagement between the AFA and its members. So we're giving that agenda over to our members to, to decide, to lead it. It will be very future focused, which is good for XY. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, and so how, did, how supportive do you think the current regulatory framework is for those trying to um, provide really sort of high value advice and I suppose that that forward looking uh, advice industry like I know a lot of people are within the XY community. Um, I'm not sure that that's actually the job of the compliance framework. Um, legislators and regulators, I don't, I'm not sure they're seeing it through that lens exactly. At this stage the lens they're using is holding us to public account. Um, the rules we've got are more than adequate to do that. The policing of those laws could be stronger. I, I hear constantly from members that it's frustrating that they come across someone who's acting uh, unprofessionally, they take it to ASIC and they don't see any action taken uh, because ASIC doesn't have the resources to, to chase every lead. Um, again, this is where professional standards are really important. If you can complain to your professional body because they have to be a member of one or at least of a code issuing body, action can be taken. So I, I'm not sure that that's the real focus of where legislation and compliance is headed. Mm -hmm. So I know because I know when we were chatting last week uh, in preparation for this, we were chatting a bit about legislation and I asked you what do you think needs to change. You sort of came at a different approach with uh, around this ethical framework, and you maybe just just explain that and, and give us your thoughts on uh, on the, on how that might be able to support perhaps better than than uh, the regulation. Yeah, again, 
The, the whole idea about professional standards is that usually in, in other professions, they operate above the minimum of the law. The law sets out how you've got to do things, but it doesn't really cross over into this what was your intent. And what uh, the associations have been working on and a number of the, the larger licensees as well is how we can create a common framework that has this uplift in ethical standards that gives a very public uh, view and opinion um, that every advisor has come up to uh, an appropriate level. It's, it's something visible, it's something that can be, you know, stuck in the ground as a flag post or as a milestone marker and uh, the code of conduct, code of ethics, whatever name you want to put around it is part of that and also an exam or an equivalent to show that you've got the level of knowledge is part of that. They're very public markers to say everyone that remains in the profession is at standard or above. So I think that's that's an important part that we need to continue to head down and it doesn't have to be driven by law. Yeah, and do you think that the um, like mandatory industry body membership is something that could be supportive and, and actually raise the bar when it comes to um, standards if, uh, you know, this ethical framework is in place and then you're required to have membership and um, mm. that, that could potentially help to... Uh, to, I suppose, raise the bar? Then the moment I say yes to that, um, we get accused by some of self-interest. Um, <laughs> no, I, don't, I just no, don't... That was me, I, that was me who accused you. <laughs> yeah, it was, Phil. And I think you were just being annoying. But anyway, and look, the, the reality is, right, there is no self-interest from a professional body. We either get bigger or we get smaller, but it's actually about the public good that our members create. That's what a professional body is there for. Um, should we be bigger and stronger? Well, that would be great. It doesn't change what we're about. It doesn't change what we do. It just means more people are part of that journey. So should there be compulsory professional body membership? Yes, there should. Do the professional bodies need to earn their stripes to be called a professional body? Yes, they do. That needs to go through some sort of sign-off process, which other professions have as well. So yes, we should have it. Absolutely, we should. And what that means is a very difficult um, rub between the professional body leading, inspiring and supporting its membership, but also having to hold its membership to account, where if we say you can't be a member anymore because your conduct is not appropriate, we actually take away your right to practice. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not something the AFA has ever really wanted to have, but for us to be called a profession, that's the direction this heads. Yeah, and what do you say? I've already heard the answer to this one, but I'm sure that those watching in would be interested to hear. But what do you say to those that say that that conflict does exist um, between you know you wanting to obviously say that the membership should be mandatory so so that you guys grow, and that 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 the conflict exists in terms of why why are you going to kick people out when you then you you know that's a uh, obviously one less member for you guys. Um, this is the higher purpose of professional bodies, Ben. You know, we will always have that rub between having a member in or putting a member out. We have it now. Um, that's not a conflict of interest in as much as one individual member uh, is not a financial concern to the AFA uh, per se. You know, you know, membership, depending on what sort of member you are, between 600 and $700-odd dollars, it's not much in an association turning over four and a half million. So that individual conflict is nothing uh, in terms of a concern to us. Um, if others, uh, it would be the same concern that the Law Society has, the same concern the engineering bodies have, the, the Royal Australian College of GPs. Uh, that's, that's not a conflict that I think any of us need to defend. Being part of a professional body that has the consumer interest, the, the, the greater good of society's interest at the forefront, um, removes, should remove that type of accusation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense to me. Uh, so I've just got, so that's great. Um, I've got a couple of questions. We'll get to the audience questions. Um, and I've had a couple that were sent in to us yesterday. Um, 
first question, do we all need to get big quick? And as a follow-up, like, is, a, is building a financial planning business or a successful one all about scale or is it possible to run a, a, a practice with one rep and still be profitable looking forward? Um, I think it is. You know, one of the, uh, I guess, uh, foundation blocks that the AFA's had about policy settings is we don't think it should be for the professional bodies or the government to mandate business models. That there should be settings that people can choose their business model. Um, I think that outsourcing is going to be super critical for someone that wants to operate in a very small or boutique way. Um, I think avoiding being caught in a bubble of only knowing your own world uh, has to be uh, avoided or, or precautions taken against that because markets can move past you, standards can move past you if you aren't part of that larger advice community. Um, but I don't think you have to necessarily be big. I think what we will see is more large practices, self-licensed or not, um, as we go forward. Because again, we see this in other professional spaces uh, that over time as they develop, more professionals want to work together, which allows greater specialisation, greater sharing of ideas and greater sharing of ideals. So I think we will see larger practices, but I don't think it should be um, the only way forward. Yeah, okay. And I suppose in the same sort of tangent, what do you what do you see small uh, successful small practices doing differently, and how how do you think that they could uh, position themselves best to run a, um, a value for their clients, but then profitable for their business ongoing service? Um, the smaller you are, the tighter your niche of market needs to be. So if you can't bring uh, scale in the normal sense, then you need to build um, replicable kinds of models. So the front end to the client needs to be bespoke, uh, very much individualised. But what happens behind that uh, needs to be pretty similar from one client to another. Mm -hmm. If you have to reinvent world and expand your knowledge for every single client, which let's be honest, first year advising, that's what you're doing. It feels yeah. like every client you get is a, is a you know a new uh, thesis at university. Um, we need you need to get to a point where that, that's not the case. So the narrower your niche, the better it is if you're small. Once you're larger, you can get this swapping of, of knowledge and experience and ideas across multiple people. So I think that that's a key part. I think another key part, if you're going to be small, is two things. Outsource, don't write your SOAs. The moment you outsource your SOAs, uh, you understand better the value and the cost of providing advice and what you should be charging. Mm -hmm. So I would outsource SOAs definitely and I would also make sure that I had a regular catch up with other advisors, um, you know, perhaps on a monthly basis that can be a truth and honesty network. Um, I had one, um, I had a terrific one with three other guys, we used to catch up monthly and then got out to two monthly and then quarterly, where we could just be absolutely honest with each other about what we've done really well. As Australians, we don't let, allow our uh, other people to claim success, so there's not many places you can share it, but this safety bubble let us do that, and it also let us share what we've absolutely stuffed up, so yeah. that we can get the ideas of our peers on how not to repeat the mistake. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a great idea, um, and you know that's what we've found definitely in the XY community is that that's where you you, you get the most tips, and uh, I know it's something that's helped me massively in my business. So yeah, and, and Ben, I'd, I'd also throw alongside that: make sure you get a mentor. Um, so, like the AFA mentoring program has about two hundred people in it each year, and that's incredibly important as well. And especially if the mentor. Um, doesn't come from exactly the same kind of business as you're trying to set up and create, then you're getting um, a breadth of ideas, which is really good. It pulls you out of being so close to the knitting in your own practice to get more of that helicopter view that lets you get a better perspective on what it is you are trying to do. So I'd suggest you know, get involved in things like the AFA mentoring program as well. Yeah, terrific. Um, okay, and we've got a couple of questions from Shane Hay here. He's been uh, busy in the question box this morning. Um, first one, why why do you, 
you, you think it is that the big four or five or six banks that set the agenda in our industry and, and when will our associations take it to them to, to really set the agenda of advisors? Well, I guess that's a challenging question that's coming from a particular point of view um, and it's one that I don't accept. Um, we don't sit around the table asking the big four, five or six what our agenda should be. Mm -hmm. We form our agenda. That's why we have nine directors that are all practicing financial advisors. At the moment, they're all practice owners. They have very strong views on where we need to take the world of advice. And that's what we take to the table. Um, through periods of last year and the year before, uh, the FBA and ourselves were meeting with a number of those large licensee owners and it wasn't friendly. It was yeah. a conducive, challenging, collaborative environment, but I wouldn't say it was friendly. Um, we don't share all the same views and we constantly um, persuade, uh, set our views, challenge them on theirs, um, and that's the way things progress. It's it's not a case of, I mean, we, it, this is interesting. You know, the LICG just wrote something that uh, aligned advisors are part of the problem. Well, I'm sure out of uh, the people that think the LICG are doing a great job, there's a lot of aligned advisor in a, uh, an apogee or a financial wisdom or whatever other uh, licensees. Um, we have about half of Australia's advisors in those groups. Mm -hmm. So they do have a significant point. But those advisors are also members of the AFA or the FPA. So yes. their interests are being fought for on multiple fronts and and yeah it's certainly not a case of we all sit around the the table and uh, say well, right what do you guys want okay we'll go do that it's nothing like that at all yeah yeah okay and i suppose is it a follow-up question on that sort of point from from joel uh vertical integration supports the current afsl model and without it afsls are unprofitable What's your view on vertical integration and how can dealer groups survive beyond uh, the vertical integration in its current form? Um, look, I, my, this is a personal view, so let me take the AFA hat off. I've never liked the thought that a licensee is subsidised by product. I don't like that idea. And I would like to think that one day, uh, not too far down the track, that can stop. Um, so what does that mean? Well, I think advisors, individual advisors, need to make their own very strong choices about how they fit in the ecosystem of financial advice. If it's not providing a conflict to them, then uh, good. If they feel that they're conflicted, they have to make a change. That's their own brand, their own professionalism stance. Um, but there are aligned models, and I was in one of them, where I certainly didn't feel constrained at all by the ultimate owner of that licensee. Um, I often went outside the APL where I needed to and I didn't get contested on that. There was a process to go through to get the sign off or the authority to do it and I was doing those often on a weekly basis. Yeah. So it's not that the vertical integration model uh, per se is a problem, um, but then when you do see groups like Suncorp fold a licensee like Guardian with over 100 advisors in it, Clearly, the forces and the pressures in that part of the market are intense. So yes. no matter who the licensee is, they've got to have a value proposition. And it shouldn't come, in my view, from the, the, the starting point of it's subsidised. But advisors also often don't want to pay the full cost that it takes to provide the licensee services. Yeah. So advisors have to ask that question of themselves too. Are they prepared to pay? Yeah. Yeah, okay. And so on that point, another, another question from, from Joel or Joel. Um, uh, licensees have previously held all the power. Do you think that there is um, a, a, sport, a space for the niche of uh, like providing these outsourced AFS, AFSL solutions for a group of, say, you know, smaller group of practices, say five? five sort of medium size or, or smaller high performing practices, so. Um, this has already begun. Um, the, there's services out there like that. And uh, I think um, we'll see a growing trend towards existing licensees 
often in the boutique space, um, you know, small, let's say less than 40 or 50 advisors that have terrific systems, um, have good technology, and they'll leverage that by providing back office services to people that are self-licensed. So I think we will see that grow as a trend um, as we as we get through the next two, three, four years. And this will be part of licensees discovering their value proposition and saying, well, how do we leverage it? If there's different segments of the advisor market, some that want to be in a licensee, some that want to be self-licensed, how do we get um, a sustainable level of revenue from our expertise? Yeah. And that's one way of doing it is, carving off a, a business opportunity, which is to say, we provide your outsourced solution. Mm. Makes sense. Okay, one, one last question um, from the group from me. Um, what, what trends do you see coming from the US and what can we learn from their market and, and um, use to push us forward over here? That's from, that's from Deborah King, the boss. From Deb. Yes, sorry. From Deborah King. <laughs> um, I I should uh, deflect to my president and have her answer the question. <laughs> um, look, a couple of things. There is, there's a, a word doing the rounds over there called co-opetition, uh, which is collaborative competition cut short, right? Co-opetition. And you see companies like IBM. This year, we, I went over um, Silicon Valley and, and went to IBM in New York, and we met Watson, their artificial intelligence machine. And what Watson is a platform. But what IBM are doing with it is something not IBM-ish at all. They're now going to what companies that in the past would have been seen as a competitor and letting them build interface software, interface applications that make use of their artificial intelligence platform. So former competitors now working together in co-opetition to create a better client experience, consumer outcome, and effectively, in some ways, creating new markets altogether. So Australia can learn from that in this innovation space. How do we collaborate our way forward? This this is very much in line with the theme that the AFA has just taken through our roadshow and have a conference called Adaptive Change, Taking Advice Beyond the Horizon. Adaptive Change actually comes from some academic theory called Adaptive Challenge by Ron Heifetz. And it's about saying that when the paradigms for an industry change, the incumbents have to change to survive. You can't stay the same. But the way to change is to experiment and share your results with peers, co-opetition effectively. That what you're doing is you're speeding up the process of everyone learning and finding out what will work beyond the horizon that you can see today. And I reckon our horizon for financial advice we can see is only two years out maybe three with a bit of fogginess. Yeah. But beyond that, I don't think we can see where we need to be because the speed technology is going to both compete with advice and support advice. We need to move to this model that is high touch, high tech and low cost. That's what we see as being the, the best practice of the future. High touch, high tech supported, lower cost to deliver. So just a quick follow-up on that. Road to Sorry, Ray, just a quick follow-up on that co-opetition. Uh, in, in the example of IBM, IBM held all the cards in that, in that space. And so if, you, if we reflect it back to financial advice, the, the, big, the big banks are holding the cards in that where they can open up co-opetition or they can keep it closed um, or continue to keep it closed. Uh, do you see any appetite in the, in the big banks uh, looking at doing that? Um, some of the banks, uh, not just banks, some of the large players are investing a lot of money in technology to support their advisors in terms of what we would call herbivore solutions. So they're helping advisors provide advice, um, both at the client interface and also in the back office. We're also seeing others that are investing a lot of money in what we would call carnivores, which is designed to compete and take market share or reach new markets that aren't currently being serviced, so the 18, 10 Australians that aren't getting advice. So we're seeing a, a huge investment, millions and millions of dollars that individual practices can't do. So what practices are going to need to do is work out where they're going to bring two things, the efficiency to their practice through accessing um, digitally enabled solutions. And the second thing is, don't ever give up your point of difference to being in a scale model. Banks at the end of the day operate scale models and they're hamstrung by their ability to change that. 
Mm. So for those that aren't in that world, you must keep your competitive advantage of being small, being nimble, being bespoke, proximity to your client, the uniqueness of who you are and the identity brand of your own business or practice. Their competitive advantage is that's the business mode you have and you mustn't give it up. Yeah. No, I know I know First Aid Super, I think they invest $120 million in a in a fintech startup uh, venture fund and uh, I know Westpac is investing heavily into um, into venture capital funds as well. Um, so yeah, watch watch this space. Um, so we're gonna wrap it up. We've got heaps more questions uh, from the audience. One thing I'd love from you, Brad, uh, you've been very generous with your time, uh, but if we can maybe move these questions onto LinkedIn and if Brad can get a chance over the next two weeks um, to uh, maybe just just quickly touch on some of these questions, that would be awesome. Um, if not, we understand you're, you're a very busy man, um, but maybe get one of your minions to do it for you. Uh, that'd be good. Mate, the, the AFA, we don't have minions, mate. We have a very <laughs> yeah. flat team-based environment. That's no right, minions. that's right. <laughs> so we'll, we'll wrap up here. Uh, any questions that we missed out on? Because I know we missed out on a few. Let's move it over to LinkedIn uh, and maybe we can we can get some discussion around it um, from Brad and from others uh, around. Um, so just to finish off, it was great to uh, hear, hear what you, your top three things, or maybe not your top three things, but the three things you want to see uh, different in the next few years uh, was stability, uh, making sure that it's really important that we uh, keep uh, uh, we set we set a standard and so we so advisors can run with it, uh, and um, putting succession planning in the forefront of, of uh, advice, uh, and also making sure that we're helping uh, the public understand uh, the benefit of advice. Uh, so thanks, Brad, and also it's not the first time I've been called annoying, and definitely not going to be the last. <laughs> um, thanks heaps for coming um, and, uh, and, and there was great interest from, from everyone so thanks again Pleasure guys, uh, thanks for the opportunity and uh, look forward to how uh, the AFA and Gen Next and XY Advisor do, uh, do more stuff and talk together, be good Perfect, Absolutely. thanks Brad and thanks for everyone right. and we run these every fortnight so if this is your first time here uh, jump on next fortnight uh, and we also have a replay or, or a recording of this interview. Uh, we put it on YouTube. So go check it out, guys. Thanks, everyone, for coming. And we'll see you in a fortnight.